Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 27th of March and a number of pretty cool changes this week. As always, if this is useful, please go ahead and like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new updates. Chapters on the bottom of the video or you can see in the description if you want to jump around to any particular update. New videos this week, I created a study cram for the SC300. So if you're looking at that identity administration certification, it's nearly three hours long. I go through all of the key concepts. I show a few things. And then to go with that, I added to my certification materials, a GitHub repo, a link to I create a playlist with deeper dive videos into the content and then the whiteboard in the video. So if you're looking at that cert, hopefully that might help you out. Onto the changes, so on the compute side, so the HBV3 has been upgraded. So you think about this as part of these high performance computing workloads. And what's happening from the 21st of March, if I do a new deployment, it goes on a newer generation of the AMD Epic third gen processors. This is Milan X. So it's got this new 3DV cache and basically what it means is I get better performance. Now there's a whole bunch of different statistics around this, but it talks about 80% higher performance for memory, uh, bandwidth and latency bound workloads and a whole bunch of other things. This gives me 200 gigabit InfiniBand. So it's basically just an upgraded set. There's not a price difference for this. If I re-provision my existing ones, I'll go and get this new hardware. So that's available. Azure Stack Hub, remember Azure Stack Hub is the turnkey appliance we purchase. It's got local endpoints for management. It's that complete localized set of Azure services. And now on the Azure Stack Hub, if I go to the 2108 update, now we have Azure Kubernetes service and the Azure Container Registry available locally on that device. So those are now available. There's an API management change for the IP that I would use to actually go and communicate to it. What they're doing in a number of regions, they're moving to a zone redundant IP address. So it necessitates them changing the IP. Now ordinarily this is not a big deal, but if I have network security group rules in my virtual network that communicates to this and I'm not using the service tag, but actually using the IP directly, well then the IP address is changing. So the document is in the description below, but essentially it's saying, hey, look, the old IP address and the new IP address. So you would need to go and make that change. It's kind of stressing the point that, hey, this is gonna be an issue for NSGs or UDRs if you're using the explicit source IP address. But one of the things it's really sort of saying to do is look, use the service tag instead. So instead of putting in that IP address, use the service tag and that service tag, well, that just gets updated if they ever do change the IP address. And it talks about, hey, service tag, API management. So documentation does walk through what you actually need to change um, to jump over to that. And then another cool thing is there's a whole bunch of confidential computing we think about the idea that we either encrypt the entire virtual machine uh, via the AMD technologies, or we can create protected enclaves within the virtual machine with the Intel SGX. This is all about giving us um, protection at different levels. Hey, I don't trust things within my guest OS. Hey, the Intel SGX and those protected enclaves give me that. So what now they're talking about is beyond just secure computing CPUs, there's now these confidential GPUs have been announced. So these would work with um, confidential computing CPU offerings like the, the DC, EC, et cetera series. But now the GPU will also have that ability to have that encrypted memory. And there'd be a secure information exchange between the CPU and the GPU. So this is the NVIDIA Ampere A100 GPUs. There's gonna be a special confidential GPU driver. But if I think certain machine learning, um, training scenarios where I've got very sensitive data, that's actually gonna be a really cool big deal. So that was announced. So I think there's gonna be some previews on the way. 
On the networking side, so the standard load balancer now can support an inbound NAT port range. So what does that mean? So ordinarily NAT, we think about, hey, a certain port coming in on the, the front end of our kind of load balancer. So maybe I have my load balancer, and I could say, hey, for this port, I'm just gonna say 3389, well, that NAT rule would point to a certain VM. I would say, hey, VM1, port 3389, or whatever that might be. What I can now do is I can actually say, hey, instead of being one port, I can say, hey, look, start at port 500, and you can use up to 100 ports. So it would now have a range from 500 to 600. And instead of pointing to a virtual machine, I can actually point to the back end pool. So now what it will automatically do is on the front end, we'll say, hey, port 500 goes to that VM, 501 goes to that VM, 502 goes to that VM. And that would all be the same port. So maybe that's all 3389 on each one of those. But it's now letting me, instead of having to create a separate NAT rule, and maybe I wanted that direct connection to every backend member, now I can just go in and say, hey, no, I just want to use a NAT port range. Start at this port. Um, I have a range of 100, so it would use 500 to 600, and I'm gonna point at a backend port instead of an individual virtual machine. So that is now in GA, you can see it in the portal. Just go and look at any standard load balancer and look at the NAT rules, and the target you'll now be able to select the, the back end instead of just virtual machine. The VM option is still there, I don't have to use this range, but it, it's now an option if I wanted to facilitate that. And if you go and look in the portal, it actually shows you which of the ports from that front end it's allocated to each of the virtual machines. So moving on, on the database side, so Azure Data Explorer now has a multiple database support per connection. Ordinarily, when I define a data connection, I define a database and a table. So if I'm ingesting data from an event hub, from an IoT hub, from event grid, well, when it goes through that connection, it goes to that database and table that I've specified. I can now optionally turn on this ability to enable a multi-database connection. And then as part of that um, properties of the, the data, there's a database ingestion property. And in that property, I can override the database, I can override the table to now go to a different database and a different table. So we now have that ability, hey, multiple databases for a single connection. User assigned managed identity is now available for stream analytics. So if I think about ordinarily a managed identity, remember there's a system assigned. A system assigned managed identity is usable only by a specific resource. And then I can give that identity permission roles to other resources that the resource can just now transparently use. I don't have to store a secret or cert anywhere. User assigned is useful where I can separately create managed identity of its own life cycle and then give that identity access to various resources. And then I say, well, these sets of resources can act as that user identity. That's really powerful if I have a whole set of different resources, one in the same sets of permissions to another set of resources, hey, I don't have to duplicate that with a whole bunch of system assigned managed identities. So now, Stream Analytics can use a user assigned managed identity for both its connections to inputs and outputs. There's a new Finland central region uh, has been announced. It will have availability zones. An Azure AD MFA number matching has gone GA. So remember the whole point of multi-factor authentication. We don't wanna constantly be prompting people. It should be, I wanna prompt someone where they're doing some kind of elevation, or I've detected some elevated risk. I've got signals coming in, and then I want to MFA them because we don't want muscle memory. I don't want people to just constantly get prompted for MFA and they just, oh yes, 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 it's me. So there were shifts in the MFA to really try and snap people out of that muscle memory. So some of the things we can do with MFA, and let's actually just go and look at this, is 
Well, look, instead of just saying, hey, MFA, yes, it's going to show you a number. And I have to pick the right number out of a set of selections. Now we can even say, hey, I'm going to show you a number. You have to type in the number. You're not going to select it out of three possible ones. You actually have to go and type it in. And we also have the option of like showing where is this connection from more context. So I'm like, wait, I'm not connecting from Finland. Uh, I'm in Texas. So it helps just really snap the user out of any kind of lazy not thinking about it to, hey, you have to go and type in this number. Okay, I need to give it a bit more attention. So if I go and look at, for example, my Azure Active Directory, if I go and look at my um, security, and I look at my, well, that's not good. Let's try that one more time. It's kind of interesting. Try that one more time. So if I go to my security, there we go, and I go to my authentication methods, we can see we have the Azure Authenticator, the Microsoft Authenticator app. And what I'm doing is I could do this based on a particular group of users, but if I go all the way over here to the right-hand side, I have these three little dots. And I'm gonna click those and hit configure. And now we get these options. So we have things like authentication mode, but I can also require number matching. So instead of saying Microsoft Manage where they're gonna make a decision based on the tenant and the things it's seeing, I could say enabled. I'll now force that number matching to be required. Also in my tenant, I've turned on additional context. So again, I'm not letting Microsoft decide, I'm just enabling it. So when I get an MFA prompt, it's gonna show me my location actually as part of that prompt. So those are there, and that's in GA, so you can uh, go and try those things out. So moving on uh, beyond that, there's a whole bunch of retirements. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. So Azure Data Lake Analytics is retiring the end of February 2024, moved to Azure Synapse Analytics. Node 14 LDS, uh, end of April 23, moved to Node 16 LTS. So there might be a newer version uh, by the time you actually start moving. App Insight Key Ingestion, end of March 25. So what we're gonna now do, instead of using an instrumentation key that's based on a global endpoint, Instead, you're gonna to move to the regional endpoint with a connection string. That gives you benefits around, well, I can actually have authenticated telemetry ingestion. I get certain levels of regional data resiliency, and there's a customization of that endpoint for intranet hybrid environments. Q&A Maker is going away end of March 2025. I think just move to something else. I don't think there's a native Azure solution for that. So you'll need to go and find something else. .NET Core 3.1, uh, 3rd of December, 2022. So think about moving to .NET 6. So if I'm using Azure App Service, for example, I'm using .NET Core 3.1. That extended support is ending 3rd of December, 2022. So I need to move to a newer version. Time Series Insights, end of March, 2025. Uh, move to Azure Data Explorer. Templates in preview. So it's never got out of preview, but in the Azure portal, there was a template experience. Uh, end of March, 2025, it's gonna go away. Go to template specs instead. Template specs is awesome. I have a whole separate video on template specs. Um, leverage that. IoT Central Classic Data Export, end of March, 2023, move to the new data export. And then Azure MFA Operator Assistance, it's going away end of September 2023. There's an automated assistant functionality you can use instead. So a whole bunch of things getting old, um, out of the old, in with the new. So that was it. Uh, as always, I hope this is useful. Until the next video, take care.